Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda Baptist Church Sunday School Hour, the Fruit Bearer Sunday School class. Uh, my name is Jim Tate. I'm the assistant teacher for that class. And I'm so glad you're able to join with me today as we continue our study of God's Word and into why do I need the church. This is the fourth lesson out of this session as we continue this study. Our study today is entitled, We Encourage One Another. And the point of this lesson is that we need the encouragement of others and they need ours. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you humbly this morning, Lord, thanking you and giving you praise for all of the many blessings that you provide for us. We thank you for caring for us, providing for us on a daily basis, Lord. We know that it is out of your graciousness and love, not because we deserve it. We thank you for the encouragement that we get from your word. We thank you for the encouragement we receive from our church family, that each and every one of us can encourage each other, lift each other up, be there in time of need and sorrow and time of trouble. We are thankful you for that opportunity. We thank you for this loving brotherhood. We ask that you be with our sick, that you know who they are, Lord, and what their ailments are. We ask that you heal them, bring them back to us, Lord, and bring them back to their normal, healthy life. We ask that you protect the world and our community from this pandemic that's going around it seems to be spreading at a rapid pace and not letting up we uh, ask that you relieve us from this uh, pandemic relieve us from this punishment Lord we pray for those that have it that you will heal them and we pray for those who do not have it that they will not contact it so all of these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name Amen <clears throat> our lesson today is that uh, we all need encouragement we need the encouragement of other people and we should expect to receive that encouragement from our fellow Christians and our brothers and sisters here in this church and we do our scripture today is taken from the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 32. The uh, setting for this uh, lesson was back uh, when Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians. And Paul was an expert in encouragement. Uh, when Saul or Paul became a Christian some of the other Christians seemed slow to welcome him. But Barnabas, a nickname meaning son of encouragement, he reached out to Paul and introduced him to the Jerusalem church. This is in Acts 4.36 and 9.26-27. Paul often stressed Christians need to encourage one another. For example, Wherefore, comfort yourself together and edify one another, even as also ye do. 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 11. If you look at page 132 in your study guide, you'll see a picture there and a question, when have you benefited from a little encouragement? You know, I think we've all been encouraged in our lives, if nothing else, by our mothers or maybe our fathers, brothers or sisters or close friends. Uh, your study guide talks about a child back in 1895 who was uh, given a camera by his mother. Now, I can't imagine how technical cameras were back in 1895, but apparently they required a little more uh, knowledge than, than what we have today. Uh, it, it tells us this child shot like 50, 50 photographs 
or 50 pictures around the house, but only one of them turned out when they were developed where you could see what it was. And that was a picture of his sister playing the piano. Well, he was pretty discouraged. His father thought it was pretty discouraging. But his mother encouraged him. She thought one picture was wonderful. He needed to not give up. So he continued, based on the encouragement from his mother, to, with his hobby, and became one of the world's most renowned photographers. So uh, you never know what a little encouragement will lead to. The Christian life can be hard at times. Temptations abound and we sometimes struggle to honor God in our lives. Encouragement from fellow believers is a great help in this struggle. Their words of support push us forward when we might be tempted to give up or give in. We need the encouragement of others and they need our encouragement. So the encouragement from uh, fellow believers can be a great help in, in, a, in any struggle. We gain strength as others come alongside us with encouraging words of support. It helps knowing that we are not alone in our struggles. That others wrestle with the same issues and difficulties as we do. Our first scripture reading comes from Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 22. They say, I therefore, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their minds, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart who be in past feeling have given themselves over unto less of viciousness, that is, the uh, inclined to, to lust, to walk all uncleanliness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Key words here, Gentiles, which uh, is non-Jewish ethnic group. The Jews divided all humanity into two groups, Jews and Gentiles. Sometimes Gentile refers to immoral pagan way of life. And the old man refers to the condition of a person before becoming a Christian. A non-believer. This person is enslaved to, enslaved to sin and alienated from God. So when you become saved, you put off the old man, the old person, the old you, and, and put on the new. In verse 17, Paul insisted his readers put away sinful habits. He began this section with, This I say, therefore a phrase signaling a transition to a new topic. As we saw in the last session in chapters 4 through 6, Paul highlighted the practical application of his teaching about Christ, salvation, and the church. Here Paul emphasized the racial change his readers had experienced when they became Christians. Paul gave us two snapshots of a person before salvation and a person who is now a Christian. Eventually he would stress how believers should relate to one another in the church. First Paul noted that his readers henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. The church of Ephesus had some members of the Gentile ethnic group. In verse 17 Paul referred to Gentile pagan immoral behavior more than ethnicity. Paul's characterization of the Gentiles in this section resembles his fuller discussion in Romans 1. There Paul emphasized the university of sin. And he began with a description of pagans 
in the Roman Empire. Although some Romans were intellectually brilliant, in general, Paul highlighted the vanity of their mind. They had rejected the revelation of God in nature, so they failed to have the right relationship to the true God. In verse 18, Paul continued to describe the spiritual condition of the Gentiles before they became Christians. These pagans experienced spiritual darkness because they did not receive the spiritual light available to them. They were alienated from the life of God. Paul used a variety of word pictures to capture the nature of salvation in Romans 3, 24 through 25. For example, he depicted salvation as justification and redemption, and he presented Christ's work as an atoning sacrifice. Sometimes he used imaginary, sometimes he used imagery of a transition from spiritual death to life. Earlier he wrote, people were dead in trespass and sin. When the Gentiles stressed Jesus as Lord and Savior, they would experience spiritual life, the life of God. In their sinful state, the Gentiles were ignorant of God and the salvation he offered them. No matter how intellectually bright they might have been, they needed the good news about Jesus. Paul also pointed to the blindness of their heart. In the Bible, the word heart typically refers to the inner person or a person's identity, not the muscle that pumps blood. Blindness of the heart is uh, a word picture for a steady resistance to the revelation of God to a lost humanity. One scholar said the Greek could be translated as a person's heart was petrified. In verse 19, Paul highlighted the immoral lifestyle and sinful habits of non-Christians, Gentiles in this verse. <clears throat> Such persons were past feeling. One result of this spiritual and moral insensitivity was a promiscuous lifestyle in Romans 1, 26, 27, Paul gave examples of pagan sexual immorality. In Ephesians 4, 19, Paul referred to their uncleanliness in a more general way. Paul often pointed to greed as a sinful pagan characteristic, and he called greed kind of an idolatry. In verse 20, he began comparison between the spiritual and moral state of the unsaved person and that person's new situation in Christ. His readers became Christians when they were so learned Christ. Paul did not offer details on how they came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Perhaps they were converted from the time he ministered in Ephesus. He previously had been there about three years on a missionary journey. Paul might have meant they had been instructed about Jesus and Christian morality by church leaders in Ephesus. They probably had not met Jesus during his earthly ministry. In verse 21, Paul said that his readers had been taught by him, apparently still referring to Jesus. Paul likely meant that he had learned the truth about Jesus and now knew how to live for him. Jesus has told his followers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before they were saved, as pagans, they were spiritually ignorant. And now as Christians, they have become enlightened about God's sin and salvation. Verse 22, as a pagan encountered the good news about Jesus, he or she would take off the former conversation Paul did not mean a person could do anything to save himself or herself. After all, <clears throat> after all, earlier in this letter, he had stressed salvation is by God's grace, not human deeds. Paul presented what should be the natural consequence of being saved, 
new Christians should realize their former conversation, that is, their former way of life, had become obsolete. The old man designated the unsaved person enslaved to sin. Paul never suggested salvation was a self-help project for sinners. Deceitful lust characterized the old self. Paul often depicted conversation with before and after analogies. For instance, he includes the illustration of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Earlier in the letter to Ephesians, Paul had used the word picture of a pagan being spiritually dead but becoming alive in Christ. God, even when we were dead in sin, had quickened us together in Christ. Later, he used the difference between darkness and light to point to the radical change in salvation. For you were sometimes darkness, but now ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. To recap a little, becoming a Christian is not about improving yourself, becoming more spiritual, or turning over a new leaf. It is a radical transformation, a rebirth. It's about receiving new identity, one that produces new longings, godly dispositions, and fruitful behaviors. The Christian life is marked by contrast. It's a life that distinguishes between what I used to be and what I am today. God saves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Through our new identity, he produces a new way of living. Christians aren't to do the same things non-Christians do. Christians aren't to ignore, aren't to be ignorant to God's commands. Christians aren't to allow their hearts to become hardened to the things of God. Christians aren't to increasingly pursue impure living like non-Christians do. Living in sin is now not how Jesus has taught us to live. We are to put away sinful habits. In the next verses, we also learn that we are to encourage others to live consistent with their new life in Christ. Our next scripture readings is Ephesians 4, 23 through 28. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, Wherefore, put it away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be you angry and not sin. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Again, we talk about the new man, the old man. The new man refers to a person who has become a Christian and has a new nature and life orientation. In verse 23, Paul moves to explore more about the saved person's new life in Christ. Unsaved Gentiles have been darkened in their understanding, but a saved person is renewed in the spirit of the man or the attitude of the man. Paul knew that the total person was transformed by salvation. Here he mentioned the mind, but he did not mean salvation was limited to our intellect. Throughout his ministry, Paul's writings, Paul noted that the total person was changed. He told Christians at Philippi, they should let his mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He wanted to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul was a profound thinker. He never demeaned serious thinking, but he opposed pagan philosophy. Christian, 
apologetics, often distinctively Christian intellect, responses to criticisms of our beliefs. Paul used his approach when he defended the gospel in Athens before Greek scholars. In verse 24, since Paul, since new Christians had taken off the old man, Paul remarked that they put on the new man. The phrase new man refers to the transformation experience and salvation by grace through faith. Our Greek language, or the Greek language, had two words for new. One word suggests something new and a chronological issue. That is a new day, but it might essentially be same as yesterday. In verse 24, Paul, however, used the second Greek word, which denotes a quantitative change. The new man is not the same old person. Salvation has brought about a radical change in the person's nature. The new person, after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness, according to Genesis 1, 26, 27, God created humans in his image and likeness. That image was damaged by sin, but the saved person has a renewed image. Paul also wrote that Christians are renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. In verse 25, having highlighted the new nature and position of a saved person, Paul offered several examples of practical expressions of Christian behavior. He did not intend to cover every aspect of every Christian life, but in general he wanted to show readers how their lives should be consistent in the new life in Christ. Paul began by emphasizing the need for truth-telling in the Christian life. The Jews in general already knew the fruitfulness was a legal and moral expectation. The Ten Commandments, for example, included a prohibition on false witness against thy neighbor. Paul was not concerned with the mere letter of the old law. He knew any kind of deception or lying would harm the Christian community. Because we are members of one another, we should be truthful. If we cannot trust our believers to be honest, the fabric of our community of faith quickly unravels. If someone has ever lied to you, you may have been reluctant to trust that person later on. In the Christian life, marked by contrast, we've seen what we're supposed to put off, our old sinful habits. Now let's consider what we're to put on. We are to put on the new man. And saying this, Paul painted a stark contrast between the old self and the new self. The old man was alienated from the life of God, while the new man, after God is created, the old man was characterized by darkness, ignorance, and impurity, while the two man is distinguished by righteousness and true holiness. Jesus saves us in order to change us. This does not mean we will always be perfect, but it does mean that we should not intentionally return to our old former conversations of knowingly make room for old besetting sins. We are to persistently pursue attitudes and actions consistent with our new life in Christ. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that growing in Christian likeness can be difficult. Some life changes come easier than others, but as a whole, putting on the new self can be challenging like young Edward at the camera. Our many failures might tempt us to throw in the towel. We need encouragement from others, and they need our encouragement for the same reason. Let's help one another to live consistently with our new life in Christ. 
In verse 26, Paul briefly turned to the topic of anger. And Paul quoted Psalms 4.4. 4. Here, translations disagree on whether the verse is commanding anger, be ye angry, or granting that most of us typically get angry. Uh, with either interpretation, Paul warned readers about the danger of inappropriate anger. Today we, are dis we, have, today we often distinguish types of anger ranging from mild distraction to righteous and indignant, indignant, and indignation, indignation to moral outrage, to temper tantrums. No matter what prompts our anger, we should be careful, Paul said. Sin not. However, we, whenever we are angry, emotions easily get out of hand and lead to verbal outbursts or even physical violence. Paul offered the wise advice for us when we were angry. Let not the sun go down. Sounds like advice given to married couples. Don't go to bed angry. We need to deal with whatever prompted our anger as soon as possible. In verse 27, Paul knew an angry outburst could give place to the devil. Early Christians were very aware of the role of the devil or Satan in tempting people, both Jesus and Christians. Our anger, justified or not, might become a foothold or opportunity for the devil to work in our lives. Verse 28, Paul next tackled the issue of stealing. Jewish law and many legal systems condemn stealing. Like angry words, stealing can disrupt any human society, including a church. Paul's readers might have known the account of Ananias and his wife who lied about the money they offered to the church. Although they primarily lied to God, their deception impacted the entire church. Paul, however, moved beyond a general criticism of stealing. He declared that the thief should labor, working with his hands. Paul would probably have recognized that honest labor might not always be manual labor. In Paul's day, many people had careers involving that kind of work. He encouraged work rather than laziness. Able-bodied people should work in order to be able to give to needy people. Our last scripture reading comes from uh, Ephesians 4, 29, 32, verse 29 through 32. Let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use the use of edifying, that it may Minister grace unto the hearts, hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be you kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Verse 29, Christians should encourage others with their speech, not use corrupt communications. James devoted a lot of attention to the ethics of speech. Paul and James, as well as the book of Proverbs, agree we should control our tongues. Rather than using degrading language, we should say that which is good to the use of edifying. Paul had encouraged speaking the truth in love. Paul warned readers to be truthful and honest in their dealings with others, but those conversations should be seasoned with love, compassion, sensitivity to the needs of others. Sometimes we are tempted to be too honest to a fault. Constructive criticism, for example. Is there such thing as constructive criticism? Criticism is criticism, and you have to be careful how you uh, try to criticize somebody or correct somebody. 
uh, that they don't perceive that as being chastised or criticized. Very difficult. Uh, criticism may be accepted by many who would turn off a loud, abusive statement of the same information. So you, you have to watch your, have to watch how you deliver criticism, tone of voice, demeanor, attitude. It needs to be done with love and encouragement. In verse 30, Paul added that our behavior might grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes we think the Holy Spirit more as an impersonal force or power than a personal reality. Paul spoke of the key role of the Spirit in our salvation. The Spirit seals us into the day of redemption. Paul mentioned grieving the Spirit at this point. Our improper speech might be one thing that disappoints God. Although Paul was highlighting ways to relate to another believer in this section, he acknowledged our behavior with others impacts our relationship with God as well. Verse 31, Paul mentioned several forms of inappropriate speech for Christians. This version might not be a checklist for all kinds of sinful speech, but it helps us to see how serious an issue the speech is for Christian life. Although Paul dealt primarily with the spoken word, here the application today would include all kinds of communications, telephones, email, texting, social media. Any kind of sinful speech or other communication can harm others and impact our Christian witness. Paul warned against bitterness and wrath and anger. This kind of talk results from a lack of control of anger. When our emotions control us, our speech can be negative rather than positive. We should also avoid clamor and evil speaking, blasphemy from, uh, comes from this area. Contemporary examples of rude or crude language or rhetoric are too numerous to mention. Many public fig figures seem to be over the top in their language. Paul's last example of inappropriate speech is malice. Any speech motivated by self-centeredness or some of our bad motive is wrong for Christians. Verse 32, after focusing on several negative examples of behavior, Paul turned to what he expected from believers. The phrase, one another, or its equivalent, appears twice with two different Greek terms. In this verse and many more times in Paul's writings, Christians always need to recall that they are part of a community of faith. Their behavior, good or bad, impacts other people. We should be kind and tender-hearted. Our behavior should reflect a genuine concern for the needs of other people. Because our culture generally promotes self-centeredness, we need to work hard at identifying needs of others and responding in a distinctly Christian way. Paul described the new person in Christ as someone who puts on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Paul concluded this discussion by reminding readers that they should forgive others, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Here Paul echoed the teaching of Jesus himself in many ways. Jesus' parable of forgiving servant highlighted the relation of divine forgiveness and human forgiveness. To recap some, we receive encouragement in a variety of ways. Sometimes it comes through the presence of a friend or a pat on the back. Most of the time, encouragement comes from the words of another. As a matter of fact, it's hard to imagine how one might 
be consistently encouraged in life without words. Whether written in a card, sent by text message, or spoken in person, the words of another serve as a primary means by which the Lord encourages his people. While unwholesome talk leads to a flurry of interpersonal sin, life-giving words produce just the opposite, a wellspring of interpersonal joy. Verse 32 states, And be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Speaking life-giving words both encourages our brothers and sisters in Christ and emulates our perfect Father in heaven. If you look on uh, page, let's see what it is here. Yeah, on page 140 of your personal study guide, you'll see a little exercise called Engage. It says uh, there's some words listed for what you call living words or encouraging words and heartful words. I ask you to list some of those. And uh, think about how you may have used those and how you should maybe not use those in the future. Also up under Live It Out, it says, how will you use your words to encourage others in the body of Christ? It says, talk to God through prayer. Ask God to bring to light any words, phrases, or patterns of speech that you need to put away and not use. Talk to yourself. One of the best ways to talk to yourself is speaking the word of God to yourself. Consider memorizing Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying, that is, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. And then talk to others. Uh, identify three people who might encourage, might be encouraged by your words write cards, craft emails, send texts, whatever form of communication you can face to face to help encourage those people. To wrap it up, while unwholesome talk leads to interpersonal sin, life-giving words produce just the opposite, a wellspring of interpersonal joy. So let's remember to always try to build others up and not tear them down. Carefully choose our words so that we use uh, life or loving words and not hurtful words. Let us close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this lesson. We thank you for this message, Lord, reminding us that we need to encourage one another and to be careful how we speak because it reflects on our Christian character and our Christian life that we should always be kind, tenderhearted, and then try to build people up rather than tear them down. We uh, need to practice this on a daily basis, and we need to discuss it with one another, and we need to keep it in our minds. And we thank you for this reminder, Lord. Uh, we ask you for the wisdom and the strength to be ready to encourage others at all times. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.